Well, as Pastor Smith mentioned, we'll be looking at Psalm 134 this evening. So please turn in your copy of God's Word to Psalm 134. The psalmist writes uh, one of the song, a song of ascents. Behold. Bless the Lord, all servants of the Lord, who serve by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the sanctuary and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Well, let us seek his face for his help this evening. Let's pray. Our God, we thank you for the unity, the love that you have given to us as a church for one another. We thank you for the many rich blessings you have showered upon us in times past. But dwelling together in unity this day, gathering together in your presence this night, we plead with you that you would command the blessing that we would know it now and forevermore. Be with us then as we study your word. Grant us what we need by your spirit. In Jesus' name we plead. Amen. Amen. Some people like big cars. Uh, Hummers became the, the big seller not too long ago. Uh, and I was surprised that when gas reached $4 a gallon, people were still driving them. But if I offered you a Mini Cooper tonight, would you say, nah, it's not big enough. It's not a Hummer. I won't take it. It's too small to be of any value. Say, like, no, it's still a good car, and it's... And if it gets me where I need to go, then it's what I'll, I'll buy. It's valuable to me. It's helpful to me. I have on my thumb a little cut. I get these every spring and fall when the weather starts to change and the hands get all dry. And no matter how hard you try, it just cracks and peels. It's very annoying. I can't forget it. I stand up here preaching, and I can't forget it. It constantly plagues me, though it's very small. We're going to come tonight to the second smallest psalm in this brief but hopefully profitable series on things small but sweet. Psalm 134 was really the first of the psalms that got me started on this series. I was just wrestling with what to preach and uh, a few weeks ago, I read, read this in my devotions and said, you know, that is really rich. I need to study that more. And in studying it, I said, you know, I need to preach that. And so that's what I started on, and then things got changed, and I didn't preach it. And so I'm here tonight to continue my little series after Psalm 117, the shortest psalm. John 11:35, the shortest verse. And now the second shortest psalm. Just let me highlight something of the progression. Psalm 117, we worshiped God and praised God for the gospel to the ends of the earth. John 11:35, we gave thanks to God as we focused upon the compassionate Savior. Tonight we come to study from this second of the small psalms, the worship of God. Three very foundational truths in the lives of Christians in the, and what is needed in this world. This psalm is found in our Psalter in the section on the songs of ascents. It's not exactly sure what that title means, or at least it's not 100% uh, known. I think it's fairly reasonable to believe that these are the songs that were sung by the people of Israel as they traveled up to Jerusalem for the various feasts. They start back in Psalm 120, and they start a long way off. 
They travel through many dark and difficult places until they come to Jerusalem. And there at Jerusalem, there is worship of God in a variety of ways. This is the last of those psalms, and it focuses upon worship. I have a very simple outline this evening, a brief exposition or explanation of this simple psalm, and then some pointed applications from this simple psalm. Now, of course, I have subpoints, but those are the two main points. First of all, then, a brief explanation of this simple psalm. It begins, first, with an earnest call to a simple duty. An earnest call to a simple duty. Notice that the, this, the psalm begins with this word, behold. Behold. That's the first Hebrew word in this psalm. And it's a word which is, is designed to get your attention. It's a word which is designed to grab your ears and focus them upon what is about to be said. Or if you're reading, to grab your eyes and get your mind addressed at what is here. From the outset, the psalmist wants to grab us and get a hold of our attention. And he wants to focus on uh, us upon a very simple duty. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. If you want to fill it out for the whole psalm, it's bless the Lord and be blessed by the Lord. So there's the earnest call to a simple duty. Second, the exhortation to bless Jehovah, verses 1 and 2. The exhortation to bless Jehovah. Now I'm just going to ask a few questions of, of this psalm and seek to answer those questions that we might understand what the psalmist is saying. First of all, what should be done? What is it that we are being exhorted to do? Well, to bless the Lord. Now, blessing the Lord is parallel and synonymous in many ways to praising the Lord. That is, speaking highly of Him, thanking Him, rejoicing in Him, or boasting in the Lord. That is, declaring what a great God He is to me and to us, or magnifying the Lord, speaking highly of the Lord, so as to draw everybody's attention, as it were, to put a big magnifying glass on Him so that everybody will look at Him and get a good sight of Him. Now, the reason I chose those words is because in an earlier psalm, these things are all brought together. So turn with me to Psalm 34, verses 1 to 3, where we see these words used one upon the other to give us some directive with regard to the worship of God. Here is one of the duties we ought to do in approaching God, blessing the Lord. Psalm, one, psalm 34, 1 to 3 we read this. Oh, bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And here's another word. Let us exalt, lift up the, his name together. We are to engage in this when we gather to worship God. This is what the, one of the things, one of the dominant things we need to be doing. Blessing God. Acknowledging gratefully what He is and what He has done for us. Who He is and how He acts in the world. Looking at His works, studying who He is, exalting His name, blessing His name, lifting Him up in our midst. Now, it's a good exhortation to be given because it's so easy to fall short. Especially if you stop and think about, just for a minute, and we'll come back to this, the fact that he's talking to people who are at the temple at night. Not the time when there's the most activity going on in the house of God. But specific duties that had to be done were going on there. And the exhortation is for them to continue to bless the Lord. 
to continue to engage themselves in this activity of praising him, exalting him, lifting him up, magnifying him. You see, all you have to do to miss the point is do nothing. To miss the point of worshiping God, you don't have to come in here and start shooting at people. You don't have to come in here and start cursing at one another. All you have to do is do nothing. Sit there mute. Sit there dull. Shut off your mind. And the psalmist says, behold. It's like he blew a big whistle. And then he said, bless the Lord. Engage yourself in acknowledging him in the worship of God. Now, second question here is, who should be involved? According to the psalmist, who should be involved? Now, there's many other psalms that talk about who ought to worship God. We read one of them in Psalm 100. Oftentimes it speaks of the nations. Oftentimes it speaks of the Gentiles. Sometimes it speaks... But here, who is in view? The servants of the Lord. Bless the Lord, all servants of the Lord. Those who serve by night in the house of the Lord. The you that is found here is a second person plural. It's y'all, ye, everyone. And he speaks to all servants of the Lord, those who stand in the house of the Lord. Now, the most common thought is this has to do with those who are actually have a, an official role in God's house. The Levites and the priests who served in God's house. That's who's primarily thought to be in focus here. Let's look at a couple of passages to help us glean what who might be being referred to by these, these, this phrase, those servants of the Lord standing in the house of the Lord. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 8. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 8. And this is the passage which speaks of the responsibility of the Levites and their peculiar role in the temple or in the tabernacle at this point. Deuteronomy 10 and verse 8. At that time... The Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the ark of the covenant of the Lord to stand before the Lord to serve him and to bless his name until this day. The Levites were given a peculiar role, a special role of serving God and blessing God throughout the history of the nation of Israel. Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 10 and verse 23. Here, this gets broadened significantly beyond just the Levites. 2 Kings chapter 10 and verse 23. In the reign of Jehu, Jehu went into the house of Baal with Jehonadab, the son of Rechab. And he said to the worshipers of Baal, now remember, he had given a call because in, in a deception, in, in a, in a uh, move to destroy all Baal worshipers and all Baal worship in Israel at that time, he called a great feast and he called them to the house of Baal. And he said, everybody come. And he gave them special garments and got everything wording, going just right. And he was telling them what a great time they were going to have. And he called them all together. Now they're all together and this is what he says. Search and see that there may be here with you none of the servants of the Lord, but only the worshipers of Baal. Now, it's those who are not worshipers of Baal who are servants of the Lord. It's those then who worship and follow the Lord. Those are the ones who are not to be in this house. Only the priests and the servants and those who worship Baal are to be there. The priests, that is, of Baal and those who worship Baal were to be there. So it broadens it significantly. Servants now, 
or anybody who worship, worships Jehovah. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 28 and verse 5. This is all to keep you a little bit awake this evening. As you're looking through your Bibles, Jeremiah 28 and verse 5. We've got this duel, this debate going on between Jeremiah and Hananiah, the prophet of God and the false prophet. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and in the presence of all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. All the people, now not the servants, but this phrase, standing in the house of the Lord. Everybody who was there in the court, who was part of the worship of God, who was witnessing this debate taking place between Jeremiah and Hananiah. So the servants of the Lord are those who have a peculiar, special role in the house of God, such as the Levites, such as the priests, who serve in God's house, those who are worshipers, expanding that, of Jehovah, not worshipers of Baal, those who are there in the court, worshiping God, they are the ones who are standing in the house of the Lord. Now let's turn back to Psalm 134 and turn one chapter further to Psalm 135 and see how the next psalm addresses this issue of who are the servants of the Lord, who ought to bless the Lord. Psalm 135 starts with these words, praise the Lord, praise the name of the Lord, praise him, O servants of the Lord, you who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Now drop down with me to the end of this psalm in verse 19. O house of Israel, bless the Lord. O house of Aaron, bless the Lord. O house of Levi, bless the Lord. You who fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord from Zion, who dwells in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. As much as I believe that there is a focus in Psalm 134 upon those who have a peculiar, a special role. I like that word peculiar, if you hadn't noticed that a special role, an official role, if you will, in the house of God, in the service of God, as much as there's a focus upon them, yet the term is far broader. The language is far broader than just those who have been given special responsibilities by God in his house. So who is to bless the Lord? Y'all. Every one of us. All those who stand in the house of God, all of us are servants of the Lord. Now, you come over to the New Testament, and that becomes very evident, doesn't it? If I'm going to apply this to New Testament Zion and New Testament Jerusalem, even if I want to focus in just upon those who have a special role, who are servants of God, who are the priests? in the house of Jehovah. Peter tells us, that's all of you and me. It's all of us. It's not just one person who has the special role. It's not just a little special singer over here or a little choir back there that have the special role anymore. We're all here offering up our sacrifices of praise, the fruit of our lips in thanksgiving to him. We're all here engaged and asked. We are all the servants of God in that sense. Again, I'm quoting, or, or I'd made reference to 1 Peter 2, where Peter writes, And coming to him as to a living stone rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Each of us who stands upon the foundation comes into this place as a priest. 
So there's the what and the who. Come thirdly, how should this be carried out? Bless the Lord. Who should do that? Servants of the Lord who are in his courts. How should it be carried out? Verse 2. Lift up your hands to the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Now let me go back first to that word, behold. Because it's amazing how many commentators park on that one word, and some of the old ones in particular draw all kinds of applications from it. But the main application is this. How is this to be done? Carefully. Attentively. Behold. Do this. But beyond that is to be done lifting up your hands. Now, lifting up of hands in the Old Testament was a posture that was taken in prayer. It was a posture which reflected that I was looking to heaven. I was address addressing my prayers to heaven and I was expecting the answer from heaven. If I was to receive anything, it was from heaven. And the hands up and open, as it were, some commentators state that it was probably a posture that said, I, I'm ready to receive. So it wasn't something that I was pushing somebody back. It wasn't that I was waving at somebody off in the distance. It was standing, looking, anticipating, addressing heaven, the place where God sits. This was the primary place where the lifting up of the hands came into the worship of God. The lifting up of the hands and the eyes then teaches that the mind and the heart are to be focused upon God. It's more than just a posture. It's more than just a way that we stand. It has to do with a disposition of heart, a focus of attention. The attention is to be somewhere other than here around us. And thus, similarly, we should be lifting up our hearts to God with the determination that all that we in worship do is to be focused upon Him. And all that we receive is to be anticipated as coming from Him. Now, does that mean we should lift our hands up when we pray? Going on to my next point. <laughs> when our heads are down and our eyes are closed, what you do with your hands in the air is between you and God. I'll leave it there at this point. But he goes on and says, it's also to be in holiness or toward the holy place. Now, this word, it's, it's really just a word. There's no, there's no preposition associated with it. There's, there's no way of relating it. It's just a word. It says, lift up your hands, holiness. And that word holiness may be speaking adverbially as to how our hands ought to be, what they ought to be like. They ought to be holy hands. And thus Paul may be referring to this in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8 when he says, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands. Of course, the focus there is not so much on the posture as upon the character, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. But it's interesting that I could not find one translation in the major translations that translated this psalm that way. It's always translated as referring to a place. And this word is frequently used to refer to the place where God met with his people. And I believe that's probably the appropriate reference. But look with me at Psalm 63 in verse 2 as just one example of where this word is clearly used that way. Psalm 63 and verse 2. We read in verse 1, O God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. 
My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus, I have beheld you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. I have beheld you in the sanctuary, in the holy place, in the place that you have set apart, the tabernacle where you are to be approached. It's a place where God is to be sought. I believe this is the primary reference that's being made in this verse in Psalm 134. Look with me at 1 Chronicles chapter 22 and verse 19, where the house of God and the sanctuary are brought together. 1 Chronicles 22 and verse 19. Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Arise, therefore, and build the sanctuary of the Lord. Build the kadosh, the holiness of the Lord God, so that you may bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God into, where? The house that is built for the name of the Lord. So it's the house that is built for the name of the Lord that is the place, that is the holy place. Now there's another reason why I believe this is the right use of this phrase. If you turn back to this, the psalm, or the right translation for this term, is that it fits with the psalm better that it would be speaking of a place rather than a character or nature of the worship there. Though, if the place is holy, then guess what kind of activity ought to take place there. But notice with me how the word bless appears in all three verses. Verse 1, bless the Lord. Verse 2, bless the Lord at the end of the verse. Verse 3, may the Lord bless you. The word bless appears three times. Notice that in verse 1, it is who serve by night in the house of the Lord. And then in verse 3, bless you from Zion, a reference to Jerusalem. And therefore, it would fit, in terms of the parallel structure, a triplet we would find in verse 2, a reference to the house of the Lord, a reference to Zion, the place of God's tabernacle or place of God's temple, the sanctuary. The reference is to turning one's heart to the place where God has promised to meet with his people. And making it a concentrated focus and a determined effort to be in that place. That's what these psalms of ascent, the songs of ascent, if they are those that were sung as the pilgrims made their way to Jerusalem, this is exactly what they're aiming at. The place. They're not just wandering around the countryside as lost pilgrims. They're headed to one place, the place where God meets with his people. And so we have, how should this be carried out? Carefully, with a heart turned toward God, focused upon God, looking for God to bless us. Coming into the place or the focus upon the place where he meets with his people, that holy place. And when should it be carried out? At night. That's why Pastor Smith picked all those evening hymns. Not just because it's an evening service, but because the psalm refers to worshiping him in the night, serving him by night. Now most of the commentators take and look at this by night as being the extension. Of course you do it during the day. That's when all the activity goes on, so let's extend it into the night. And so many of them speak of day and night. And again, that's, that's biblical language, First Chronicles 9 and verse 33. Now these are the singers, heads of father's household of the Levites who lived in the chambers of the temple, free from other service, for they were engaged in their work day and night. And at night, one... A uh, man mentioned that the sacred fires had to be, continue, can, to be stoked and kept going there upon the altars. The, the lampstand had to be kept lit. 
Songs were often sung in the temple throughout the night. And one man made reference to the fact that it's very likely that worshipers would go there at night to pray. And so you have this constant activity going on there in the house of God. So really, it's all the time, day and night. Not merely just at night, but if at night, then a continuation of what's done during the day. So there's, we've looked at the exhortation, the explanation of the psalm, the exhortation to bless the Lord. What should be done? Blessing God. Who should be involved? All the servants of the Lord who stand in his house. How should it be carried out? Carefully. Focused upon him in his appointed place. And when should it be carried out? Day and night. And that brings us in the third part of this explanation or exposition to the anticipation of blessing from Jehovah. The first two verses speak of the exhortation to bless Jehovah. And now the focus changes to anticipation of blessing from Jehovah in verse 3. Verse 3 is meant to be an encouragement to those who want to obey the commandment. It's an encouragement, a motivation to heed the commandment given. And so we have in this anticipation of the blessing a pronouncement of blessing. Notice it says, May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Now some think that this then focuses upon the fact that this is all for the priests. Because only the priests were the ones who spoke the blessing. We read in Numbers 6, verses 23 and through 27. If you've not thought upon this, think upon this ironic blessing that was to be pronounced by Aaron and the priests. They were to stand up and say to the people, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. So they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel, and then I will bless them. The psalmist then, by pronouncing a blessing, anticipates their obedience. He says, you do this and you can expect God to bless you. And so he motivates them, do this so you can receive the blessing. Be in the pathway of blessing. The assumption is then that the people reading this psalm want to be blessed by God, their covenant God. That's the assumption. That these worshipers who have gathered together, who are lifting up their hands, who are engaged in prayer, who are engaged in worship, that these people at God's house actually are there so that they might be blessed. Now, we need to note something. The English in my Bible loses this because it changes to bless you singular. Whereas the commandment was given to the plural, the blessing comes to each specific individual exactly as God knows they need. So it's singular. Bless you. The Lord bless each of you. But now the source of the blessing, the pronouncement of the blessing, as, they, as we anticipate the blessing from Jehovah, the source of the blessing. The source of the blessing is the creator of heaven and earth. This is kind of amazing that he would come to this. When you've got the people of God gathered together, you would expect him to say, from your God who has made love promises to you and who has entered into covenant with you, whose loving kindnesses indeed never cease. That's the kind of language I expect at this point in time. But that's not where he goes. He goes broader than that, in a sense. He goes to everything around us. And he says, the creator of heaven and earth. The creator, the one who made everything that you can see. Well, if he made everything that you and I can see, don't you think he's got enough to bless you? 
Don't you think he has enough resources to meet your needs? If he can keep the stars in their place and keep them from running into one another, don't you think he can protect you in your walk throughout the coming week? If he can cause the flowers to grow, don't you think he knows how to give you the nourishment that you need to cause you to grow? If he can protect his animals from harm, don't you think he can protect you? If the God of heaven and earth, who gives without measure, as one man said, who is set forth in this way with power. What an encouragement then to come and seek a blessing from him. He's not some local God. He's a great God. And this is the God who comes to meet with us and pronounce a blessing upon us. In another Psalm, Psalm 124 in verse 8, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Paul picks up on a similar theme. Turn with me to Acts chapter 14. This isn't just an Old Testament approach to God. Paul speaks of this when speaking to the pagans at Lystra. In Acts chapter 14, verses 15 to 17, after they've tried to offer sacrifices to to Paul and Barnabas as Zeus and Hermes, the head of the gods and his spokesman, and they're trying to stop them from doing this, and he tells them, They say to them, Acts 14, 15, Men, why are you doing these things? We we are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you in order that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. And in the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, and yet... He did not leave himself without a witness. Now, where did that, what was that witness? In that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. This God of heaven and earth, he's constantly making himself known by giving you the food that you eat, by giving you rain to cause your crops to grow. This is a great God. This is a far greater God than this Zeus that you talk about or that Hermes that you want to worship. No, this is a great God. The psalmist brings us to that and he says, come into the house of of God and bless this God and may the God of heaven bless you. But notice with me also, turning back to our psalm, he's mentioned heaven and earth as two places. He's going to mention a third place. As we speak of the source of the blessing, the source is, in terms of a person, personal agent, the creator of heaven and earth, but in terms of a place, it is Zion. He says in verse 3, May the Lord bless you from Zion. From the place at the heart of the people of Israel. From that mountain where my holy city, upon which I wrote my name, because it was mine, and that's where I meet with my people, and that's where I rule. That's where I rule from. My city, which has at, it, which has at its very heart my temple. My place where my worship takes place. Where the people gather together and engage with me, the living God. And take up and offer to me the sacrifices that I have called them to bring to me. And that is where I hear their prayers. That is where I receive their sacrifices. That is where we commune together. That's where we eat our fellowship meal together. There is where I give the blessing. It is a blessing from Zion. As one man said, a particular and discoverable place to which the Israelite could get up and go. He knew where it was. Turn back one psalm to the Psalm 133, that, that wonderful psalm about the blessings of unity. And notice verse 3. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion. And there, 
the mountains of Zion. There the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. The source, the anticipated blessing from Jehovah comes from the God of heaven at his appointed place. The psalmist says. That's the focus of the psalm. Bless the Lord in his appointed place. Bless him attentively. Bless him in the holy place. So you could make inference to the fact you better be holy to approach him. Bless him and there, where you lift him up, where you are fixed upon him, there he will meet with you and give the blessing. You put these things together. That's the way it comes out. As one man trying to put heaven and earth together and put the Zion together, to try to tie these things together. I missed this one point. Let me just add this to this anticipation of the blessing. He said, by looking to the heavens then, they were to discover the power of God. By looking to Zion, his dwelling place, they were to recognize the fatherly love of God. This one who fills heaven says, you know where to meet me. Come meet me. Now, for my second main point, having gone through the explanation, I come to some pointed applications from this simple psalm. Some pointed applications from this simple psalm. And my first application is this. Let us regularly, conscientiously, earnestly, lovingly, joyously, I can't say I sat down and chose all my words carefully, but I just can't pile up enough. Let us exhort and encourage one another to worship God together. Let's go beyond, at least Let's, let, let's at least go where they went in the Song of Ascents in Psalm 122 in verse 1. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Let's at least go there. But brethren, let us go beyond that. Let us urgently, eagerly Press these kinds of words upon one another. Bless the Lord, all the servants of the Lord, who serve by night in the house of the Lord. Let us exhort one another to come to God's house and enjoy God's house and benefit from being together. The world does it all the time. Hey, you want to go see the Yankees play? No. Hey, you want to come meet God? You want to come to the house of God where we worship God and God draws near to us? And let us exhort one another so that we gather in our worship together with hearts that are engaged to worship God. Hey, brother, no, you're a little sleepy today. Come on, stir up, buck up. Let's go meet God. Hey, what were you reading today that got you so excited that you ran in here this morning? I want to know something of that. Let's exhort one another to engage this God on a, on a weekly basis, at the very least, on the Lord's day, in His appointed place. Brethren, isn't this what the writer of Hebrews Says, I mean, it certainly can be applied to this when he says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking our assembling together as the custom of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day drawing near. Hey, brother, I didn't see you last Sunday. I know you must have been really sick. Uh, you weren't. Uh, well, you know, you really missed out. Let's get together. Let's go. 
Let's meet together with the God of heaven and earth. Let's encourage one another. Hey, brother, are you, are you wrestling with formalism? Do you find your heart drifting during the prayers? Let's pray for one another that we don't drift during the prayers. Let's encourage one another that when we sing, we're going to ask one another after the service. Hey, what was that third hymn? Don't do that at the door, please. (laughs) But, But it's these kinds of things where we're engaging one another to try to stir up one another so that we will bless the Lord when we come here. We will be engaged with God when we come here. We won't just sit here and go through it and walk out as though we had never been here or we had slept all afternoon. But brethren, let us exhort one another. The exhortation here, it's very interesting to, 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 to uh, realize or to, to read the commentators as to who's doing this exhorting of one another. Is it the high priest saying to the priests, Bless the Lord, you guys. You look a little sluggish down there. Or is it this choral activity of one group of priests singing to another group and the other group responding back and forth? Let us bless the Lord together. I think the most intriguing one, though I can't prove that it's the case, is that this being the last song of a sense, it's the people leaving the temple. And having so enjoyed being in God's house, And wanting God to continue to get His praise, because they they won't be able to do it until they come back, they look back at the Levites and the priests that are still back at the temple, and they say, Listen, guys, bless the Lord! And it's thought that maybe the people are exhorting the officials. I'm not exempt here. Please, please exhort me. In my right mind, I will accept it cheerfully. I need to be exhorted that my prayers up here are not just a show. Brethren, I I have prayed prayers from this pulpit to my shame, which are nothing but plastic. I've had to confess my sin when I sat down. I need to be exhorted. I need to exhort myself. I am here. We are here to bless the God of heaven and earth. Pastors are not exempt from needing to be encouraged. We all need to prod one another to keep our hearts and to engage in the public duties faithfully. And in particular, brethren, pray for us. Because if this does have a peculiar reference, and many of the commentators do that, one of the reasons I love this psalm is I got a lot of exhortations. Part of me just wanted to say, brethren, I'm going to preach to myself tonight and you can listen. Pastor Smith and I are going to have a little private exhortation from the Word of God. Since Pastor Chansky's not here, I would include him too if he were sitting here. The ministers need this. James Montgomery Boyce says this, What we glean from Psalm 134 is the responsibility of the appointed ministers of God to worship God themselves and by doing so to show God's people how to worship and to lead them in worship. Ministers must lead in prayer, long paragraph. Ministers must read and teach the Bible, long paragraph. Ministers must oversee the music, long paragraph. I hope... That at least in some sense, when I pass off the scene from here, there will be at least the thought that, you know what, we could write a book to Pastor Carlson about worshiping God because he obviously really loved to worship God. That's what they did for James Montgomery Boyce. The book about worship was written as something of an honor to him after he had died because he loved to worship God. He loved to sing the praises of God. He loved to pray to God. He loved to lead the people. So pray for us. Encourage us. Exhort us that we might be able to lead you and we might all find our hearts being drawn together. I get excited up here just for the sake that I like to get excited. But part of me wants to get you excited. That what we're doing here is not foolishness, not empty. It is real. So let us exhort and encourage one another to worship God together. Second, 
we should worship God thoughtfully. We should worship God thoughtfully. If you have James Montgomery Boyce, go home and read this psalm and his comments on this psalm. If you don't, I'll at least give you his heads because he had some very poignant comments to make at this point. He said, the worship of God in America is not what it ought to be, is not done carefully, is not done thoughtfully because of certain things which have infiltrated and detrimentally impacted the worship of the church. These three. Triviality, self-centeredness, and atheism. Triviality. We are trivial people in America. We get our thrills by sitting flat on our bottoms in front of a, a screen that's made of glass and going and looking at what somebody's saying about what they're doing right now. We get excited by being able to type little bitty words on these telephones and send off a little message to somebody only to get one back that says absolutely nothing about absolutely nothing. That's not all text message. I know it's useful at times, but that's oftentimes what it is. James Montgomery Boyce speaks of triviality. He says, if you sit in front of the sitcoms all week long, if you sit and listen to the radio of all the talk shows of the world all week long and your mind is filled with the brainless babble from television and the muck of the moral muck of talk shows, then guess what? No wonder you're having a hard time blessing God when you come into this place. Your mind's not used to thinking that hard. We are trivial. We are self-centered. And here I will read the comments by James Montgomery Boyce, or at least some of them. Worship is being concerned with God and His attributes. It is knowing, acknowledging, and praising God for being who He is. We cannot do that if we are thinking about ourselves all the time. The psalmist said, in short compass, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, lift up your hands to his sanctuary. In the past, true worship may have been crowded out by church's programs, so writes A.W. Tozer, and he quotes Tozer. But today, quoting Kent Hughes, senior minister of College Church in Wheaton, Illinois, was exactly right on when he wrote, and listen carefully, please. I'll try to read it so it's interesting. The unspoken but increasingly common assumption of today's Christendom is that worship is primarily for us to meet our needs. Such worship services are entertainment-focused. And the worshipers are uncommitted spectators who are silently grading the performance. From this perspective, preaching becomes a homiletics of consensus. Preaching to felt needs. Man's conscious agenda instead of God's. Such preaching is always topical and never textual. Biblical information is minimized. And the sermons are generally short and full of stories. Anything and everything that is suspected of making the marginal attender uncomfortable is removed from the service. Taken to the nth degree, this philosophy instills a tragic self-centeredness. That is, everything is judged by how it affects man. This terribly corrupts one's theology. But now, brethren, that's not just out there. I hope that you come in here and hope to receive something from the worship and hope to receive something from the sermons. I labor, Pastor Smith labors, Pastor Chansky labors to feed the sheep. And so we hope that you are fed. But that's not the primary focus. Your being fed is that you might bless the Lord. 
you're being taught is that you might honor Him. And so you are to be focused upon Him, the Lord God. Christ Jesus is to be lifted up. And all men are to be drawn unto Him in our worship. And so we ought not to think, well, you know, I've, I've already gotten enough today from my worship service. I, I went morning, I went to the Sunday school, and I went to the morning, I got enough for today. It's not about how much you got, it's what you gave. It's about blessing Him. And can we ever do that enough? Should we ever stop doing that? I know I'm getting older, and so maybe I'm getting a little more soft. But you know what? I still would love to have worship services that went all day. As long as I'm not doing the preaching, it would be great. I don't like to go home. I mean, I love being home with my family. But I don't like leaving this place when I'm in a good, hearty, healthy, spiritual state. I love sitting here. I love the fact that at 1, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we're still saying, good morning. Because mornings are long here on Sundays. But if we're here in the house of God, and it's a foretaste of heaven in which there will be no setting of the sun. Now let's be sensitive to those brethren who do need have things a little bit shorter. I'm not saying I'm going to become insensitive and now preach three-hour sermons. For brethren, let us labor to bless God, to worship God thoughtfully. Listen to the words of Alexander. And here's what's been capturing me even as I sat here this evening. These are the words that have stuck with me of all the things that I've read most. For all the parts of public worship and service, in prayer, reading the scripture, preaching, praising, and thanksgiving, singing of psalms, and blessing the people, aim at this. Behold, bless the Lord. When you had that hymn book in your hand and you were singing that hymn, Were you singing to King Jesus? Were you singing to the God of heaven and earth? Was your mind fixed upon him and his praise and his glory? Aim at this. Behold, bless the Lord. Thirdly, by way of application, we should worship God frequently. Specifically, in the night, as well as the day. And I would just say, may God help us that we never grow weary of coming back here on Sunday evenings. To have a time to finish out our Lord's Day with God. And to keep the day holy. You know what? I need this to help me keep this day holy. To remember that it's holy. I I love coming into his house and I love to be able to come back because it reminds me I can't just let the day end and drift off. The psalmists go further than that. Psalm 34, 1 says, Bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Psalm 119, 147 says, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I wait for thy words. Psalm 92, verses 1 and 2, It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to His name, O Most High, to Your name, O Most High, to declare Your loving kindness in the morning and Your faithfulness by night. And then, brethren, let us anticipate God's blessing. If this is what we are engaged in, then let us anticipate God's blessing. We're here to exalt Him. We're here to magnify Him. We're here to bless Him. But he's no man's debtor. And he's going to shower us with far more than we could ever acknowledge in him. And so let us anticipate God drawing near to us and blessing us from Zion. 
For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for His habitation. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her needy with bread. Her priests also I will clothe with salvation. And her godly ones will sing aloud for joy. There I will cause the horn of David to spring forth. I have prepared a lamp for mine anointed. My en- his enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself his crown shall shine. And the true Mount Zion, brethren, is the church of the living God, the place where Jesus Christ meets with his people. The place where two or three are gathered together in his name and in his midst. Yes, he's in our midst, but we're in his presence. This is his house. And so I end this evening, or just about end, with the words of James Montgomery Boyce. This is the only ultimate goal of any Christian, to bless God and be blessed by him. Or to quote another document of antiquity, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And my only word to you who are not in Christ is, you're missing out. And may God be pleased to open your eyes. Let's pray. Our Father, we would bless you this night. We would bless you for your rich blessings to us. We would bless you for the great character, your magnificence, your marvelous works. We plead with you that we would not be like the fool, like the stupid one who cannot see them, who does not study them, who does not look upon them and see your greatness and your wisdom. We marvel at your power as we look at the world around us. We marvel at your greatness and your goodness, even down to the the coloring of the flowers. And Lord, if you clothe the flowers, can we not anticipate that you will clothe us? If you feed the animals, can we not anticipate that you will feed us? Oh, Lord, we would bless you in this place. Be gracious, oh God, to help us. And we plead with you that you would shower your blessings upon us, that we might return to you with even greater praise and greater blessing and greater honor, lifting up your name, lifting up the name of our glorious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask, O God, that this place would be a place where you dwell with us and where we worship you until Christ returns. Please hear and answer our prayers that we might fulfill the duty in this psalm, might know the blessing you promise in it, and the many others found in your word, until Christ returns and brings us to that place where there will be no distractions and no hindrances, and we will worship you with sinless spirits in deathless bodies forever. In Jesus' glorious name we pray. Amen.